listening to Recovery, a sermon series about discovering that the gospel is our remedy. For more information about First Baptist Starville, please visit www.fbcstarville.com. By the year 1955, most U.S. homes had a television, and the world would never be the same after the television was introduced to our culture and our society. But now there's a war on programming, that is, how we get our programming. Streaming services, they've, they've cut into the market share, and shows that were once shown once a week at a particular time can now be seen on demand. So whereas we used to have to uh, turn the dial and change the channel, all we have to do now is click the button, and there is whatever show we want to watch. Let me ask you this. For those of us who've been invested in a show, who's streamed a show, have you ever been invested in a show that drags on? And then it gets to the end, only, only leaving you with this feeling that, man, they could have ended this show three episodes ago. I just wasted 12 hours or 36 hours, whatever, of my life, and they could have just really got at the heart of things and ended the show a long time ago. But today what we get the opportunity to do is I want to take you to a particular passage of Scripture. I want to take you to Galatians chapter 2, where we get to peer into a portion where Paul gets right to the heart of the matter in the churches of Galatia. Now, if we're reading Paul and getting to know the way that he writes, Paul usually spends a lot of time building up his argument. For example, in Romans, uh, he spends a lot of time building up the argument. But in Galatians, he sort of gets right at the heart of the gospel. And the reason that he gets to it rather quickly is because the truthfulness and the validity of the gospel were at stake. This church that he's writing to, this particular letter, is a particular letter where he's addressing something, and that something is false teachers who had infiltrated the church. And they had infiltrated the church saying that the gospel was Jesus plus other things equals salvation. So there were these false teachers that were coming in and saying, well, you want to be a Christian? You want to go to heaven when you die? You want to be a follower of Jesus? Well, then you have to, if you want to be saved, then you have to have Jesus plus all of these other things. And Paul comes to the church, of, in the, uh, the church in Galatia and says that these false teachers, they're off just by one little degree. And that one little degree means they miss the whole thing. There's no partial credit when it comes to salvation in Jesus. Either you are or you're not. Either you have it or you don't. You see, Paul's argument in the book of Galatians is this. Listen carefully. The gospel is not Jesus plus anything equals salvation. The gospel is Jesus paid it all. That's the gospel. So let's read the Bible as we get to see Paul lay out these things rather clear. Galatians chapter 2, I'll begin reading at verse 15, and I'll read all the way down to verse 21. Hopefully you have a Bible there, and you're following along with me this morning. Hear the Word of God. We ourselves are Jews by birth, not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, and not only by works of the law, and not, rather, by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. But in, if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So there's a phrase that's repeated in that passage, a, a word in that text that strikes at the heart of the gospel. And that word that's repeated is the word justify. It's where we get the word justification. 
Now that's one of those $5 preacher words, right? Justification. What is justification? Well, justification is important. Justification is at the heart of the gospel. But what does justification mean? I hope that you're listening, and I hope that you're taking notes. Justification is the teaching that God accepts us through Christ. That's what justification is. Simply, justification is the teaching that God accepts us through Christ. Now, there's a lot to untangle there, so let's take it a little bit at a time. The question that Christian confession has to deal with, central to the claims of Christianity, is the cross of Jesus. So the, the a question that we have to deal with is, why did Jesus die on the cross? If we're just being honest, and that's the core of our confession, then we have to deal with that question. Why did Jesus die on the cross? According to the Bible, according to Scripture, Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty of sin. According to the Bible, Christ died on the cross. The reason that He died on the cross is to pay the penalty for our sin. So no sin was in Him, and so His death was taking what He didn't have in order to give us what only He could give. Now, He was sinless. He was a sinless Savior. And so, he, since He didn't have any sin in Himself, when He died, He took what He didn't have, the wages of sin is death, and He gave us what only He could give. He took our sin so that, so that He could give us His sinlessness. He took our unrighteousness so that He could give us His righteousness. And all of those things are called justification. Justification is the way to refer to what the death of Christ on the cross has accomplished for those who trust in Him. So now through Christ, we are justified. If you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you are justified. That is, you are pardoned. You are accepted by God in Christ. And so here's what I want us to do this morning. Here's what I want us to do. In this passage, we're going to learn the heart of the gospel. And hopefully you've had a chance to get your uh, sermon journal here. I'm going to uh, ask you to take notes today. And then at the very end, I'm going to have you repeat back all these points to me. All right? So you're warned. Hopefully you'll take an opportunity to write it down. And then at the end of this, I will ask you to tell me what we just learned. But here's what I want us to do. There's going to be five truths today, okay? Five. And we're going to learn the heart of the gospel. So at the heart of the gospel, number one, hopefully you've found your pen by now or you've asked that neighbor to let you borrow theirs. Either way, number one, at the heart of the gospel is sinners who survive. That's number one, sinners who survive. So look how our passage begins. Paul says, we ourselves are Jews by birth. And then look at this particular phrase. Maybe this rubs you. It says, not Gentile sinners. How did Paul get there? What prompted him to say that we are Jews and not Gentile sinners? Well, we go back to verse 11. And here we have Paul demonstrating uh, a moment where he stood up to the apostle Peter. And I love this story. And we looked at it last week a little bit, but it's worth just reading again. But uh, here is, is two heavyweight disciples, Peter and Paul. These guys are two heavyweights. They, uh, they're, they're, one of them speaks well, and the other one writes better than he speaks. But they have this moment where they come together and they butt heads. They have this legitimate disagreement on the substance of the gospel. Look at what happens here in chapter 2 and verse 11. But when Cephas, that's another name for Peter, came to Antioch, which, by the way, Antioch is the place in Acts that they were first called Christians. Listen, listen what Paul says. I opposed Peter to his face. Why? Because he stood condemned. So get this in your picture. It was, Paul got right in the face of Peter and said, hey, buddy, you're wrong. But it wasn't as if Paul is condemning Peter. Peter was already condemned. Don't miss that. And so Paul opposes him. What was it that Peter was doing? Peter was acting in fear, being inconsistent. 
playing the hypocrite. Look at what happens here. Verse 12, before certain men came from James, he was eating. Before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, look at this language. He drew back separated himself. Why did he do that? Look at the Bible. He feared the circumcision party. These were the ones who were saying that in order to be saved, it's Jesus plus all these things. It's Jesus plus circumcision. It's Jesus plus fasting. It's Jesus plus reading your Bible. It's Jesus plus going to church. It's Jesus plus, plus, plus. Instead of Jesus paid it all. What did he do? He drew back. And look at verse 13. Look how specific is it. And the rest of the Jews acted, here's, our, here's a key word, acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Look at verse 14. But when I saw that their conduct, here's a key phrase, was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter or Cephas before them all, if you throw a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like the Jews? And so he said, Peter, you're acting like a hypocrite. He was being inconsistent. He had fear and he was playing the hypocrite. Look again at chapter 2 and verse 14. His actions were not in step with the gospel. And let me just encourage you with this. Any activity not in step with the gospel any activity not in step with the gospel is rightly called hypocrisy. Now, there's all types of hypocrisy, right? There's hypocrisy that's more out front. There's a hypocrisy that's hidden. But all hypocrisy is hypocrisy. Any time, any time that we are trusting in what we do instead of what Christ has done, we play the game of hypocrisy. Anytime that you believe that God will accept you if you just do a little more of whatever that is, maybe if I just, uh, you know, come to church a little more, read my Bible a little more, pray a little more, then God will accept me. If we play that game, if we say that God will just accept me if I do just a little more, we convince ourselves instead of realizing the, this fact that we are accepted because of what Christ has done for us, not because of what we can do or will do or did one day. We are accepted because of what Christ has done for us. And you are totally accepted by God in Christ. And I know that that's so hard for us to understand, for us to contemplate, because this is what Paul lays out in Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 6 and 7 and 8 and all the rest, where he lays out this fact of amazing grace. You can't do one thing to make God love you anymore. And you can't do one thing to make him love you any less. Because you, by faith, are in Christ. And so some of you are really struggling. I understand that. Because this is what we call amazing grace. You, you have this ingrained in your mind, this religiosity that Paul's opposing in Galatians. This idea that if you just do a little more, then God will love you even more. He will accept you. But here's the truth. God accepts you, not based upon what you can do, will do, might do, should have done. God accepts you because of Christ and Christ alone. And so I wonder if that's what it means to be a hypocrite, thinking that you can trust in what you can do or what you might do instead of what Christ has done. How many of hypocrites do we have at church here this morning? Those who came here not out of an abundance of a heart of worship, but instead they, they think that they're serving God, but in reality they just are self-serving. They're serving themselves. Jesus doesn't need you to bring anything to Him to be accepted by Him. His desire for you is to come just as you are. Isn't this the reason that Jesus' life and ministry was opposed. You remember that woman caught in the act of adultery? Here she is. She's caught in the very act of adultery. And what does Jesus say? Go and sin no more. He accepts her as she is. Here's Jesus coming on the scene. And what was one of the accusations that he had? He was a friend of sinners. He sat at the table with tax collectors and prostitutes and thieves. 
And what the rest of the religious group didn't understand was those people that he was with were closer to the kingdom of God than they were. Because they were thinking, God will accept me because of what I do. Jesus paid it all. And his desire for you is to come to him just as you are, beautifully broken, rejected, but restored, sinful, yet saved, prone to wonder, yet tethered to the cross, filled with faith and drawn to Jesus who saves. You see, don't be like Peter. Peter was wrong, and it wasn't the first time that he was wrong. We could back up just a few pages, and we could go, and we could find just a few years earlier for Peter that he met a Savior that he denied. And that Savior that he denied came to him on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Peter denied him three times, and Jesus came calling for Peter and said, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And you know what the truth of the gospel is this morning? Jesus would have asked him 10,000 more times if that's what it took. At the heart of the gospel is sinners who survive. There's space in your life to repent. There's space in your life to make it right. Maybe you realize, you know what? I am trusting in what I do instead of trusting in Christ and Christ alone. God is giving you space this morning. He's giving you space to take your thoughts captive and place them under the obedience of Christ. I remember I had a Greek professor at seminary, and one of the, we would, he would always take Dr. David Lanier. He would always take prayer requests before the class started, and he always asked a question. He would always ask us, is this person a believer? And it wasn't as if he was not going to pray for them if they weren't a believer. He asked if they were a believer, and he would always say, Lord, use these circumstances in their life to draw them to yourself. We have a God who has given space to repent. Every breath that an unbeliever takes is space that God has given them to repent and trust in him totally for their salvation. So every take courage. If you're here this morning and you're, you're play-acting, which is the, where, what the Greek word means, hypocrisy, is you're playing the part. If you're a hypocrite this morning, God has given you space that it can be made right. You say, how do I make it right? Don't trust in your good deeds. Trust in what Christ has done. You see, at the heart of the gospel is sinners who survive. Number two, there is a Christ who is crucified. For sinners to survive, Christ had to be crucified. Look at chapter 2 and verse 16. And I'm just going to walk through this uh, together. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. You follow along with these comments. A person is not justified. A person is not justified. Now, there's our word, justified. So when you read that, just put in your mind, a person is not put right with God. That's what we can understand justification made righteous or put right with God. A person is not justified by works of the law. Do you see that? Those works of the law are anything that the law approves of. And the law approves of that which is good. So a person is not uh, justified by works of the law. That is anything good that you can do, but through faith in Jesus Christ. But what specifically about Christ brings justification? What particular work of Christ brings justification? Look down at verse 21. I do not nullify the grace of God. And then here's our word. It's covered up by this word in the ESV. For if righteousness, that is, or justification, it's the same word in verse 16. If justification were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And so what specific about Christ brings justification? What particular work of Christ brings justification? What makes us right with God? Verse 21 tells us it's the death of Christ. 
Christ died in the place of ruined sinners so that ruined sinners could be restored. You see, Christ has died. But what makes us justified? Christ has died. What is it that makes us justified? Look again at chapter 2 and verse 16. Belief. Belief. Faith. Place your faith, listen, in what He's done. Not in what you can do. Not in what you might do. Not in what your mama did. Not in what your grandmother does. Place your faith, your faith, in what Christ has done. Faith in the death of Christ brings justification. There's nothing else. Nothing else. As the Protestant Reformation made clear to the Roman Catholic Church, salvation, listen to this, according to Scripture, is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for God's glory alone. And look at this. Look in the Bible. Don't miss this. Verse 16. There's a quotation here right from Psalm 143. It says, because by works of the law, no one, not one, will be justified or made righteous. So, in other words, here's what Paul is saying. These false teachers are bringing the law, saying you've misinterpreted the Old Testament. But Paul says, by quoting this Scripture, he's saying the works of the law are never intended to bring justification. The works of the law, even as good as they might be, are not meant to bring justification. You can be as faithful to your spouse as you want to and still die without Jesus and go to hell. You can never commit robbery, murder, and all of those things, but if you don't trust in Jesus Christ, it's to no eternal merit for you. That's what he's saying here, and we're going to look about that, and we're going to look at that, rather, a little clearer later, but the works of the law were to be fulfilled and realized in the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. That's how it's realized. Everything in the law is leading to Jesus' death on the cross for sinners. Jesus died in our place. He is our substitute. He is our Passover lamb. He is the goat of atonement. He is our peace offering. Him and Him alone. But notice the way this as well. We're just walking through the text here this morning. Notice the way that I'm, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version, which if you're looking for a good Bible translation, I recommend that one to you. They do a good job here. It captures the Greek. We have, look at this, we have also believed in Christ. You see that? We have also believed in Christ. Now, that's a strange way of talking, but the way that it's written that way is to capture the essence of the Greek underneath it. That is, it's referring to an event that happened in the past that continues. We have believed and are believing in Christ. So the question for you this morning is not, did you believe in Christ, so much as are you believing in Christ now? So many people come up to me and they say, Pastor, I, I don't know if I'm a Christian. And, my, my, and they always want to go back to this particular time. And to that point, I just simply want to assure them, and I just want to ask them one question. Are you believing in Jesus Christ right now? Presently and actively, do you believe in Jesus? Then if you can say yes, then you're saved. If you can say yes, then you're saved. We have also believed in Christ. It's an event that happened in the past that continues. But let's keep going into the, to the text. In order, look at this language, in order to be justified, that's future. No one will be justified, that's future. So as we also have believed in Christ, that's the past and the present. This is referring to in order to be justified, that's referring to the future. What comes in the future? What is something that all of us have waiting for us in the future? Well, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says it's appointed for a man or a woman once to die. And you know what comes afterwards? Judgment. Judgment is that moment when you will stand before God and give an account. You say, well, I don't believe in God. That doesn't matter if you believe in God or not. 
One day, everyone within the sound of my voice is going to die. And when you die, you will face God and give an account. And on that day, you will either be found just or unjust. You will either be pardoned or you will be condemned. You say, what's the difference between the two? What's the difference between just and unjust, pardon and condemn? The difference between the two is faith in Christ who died. It's not a presentation of your good deeds. All the good that you can do, you can try to amass a great life. But all the good that you can do is nothing. Because on the other side is the sinless Son of God who was crucified. There's an action done on your behalf. There's a grace that is given, a gift that is to be received, justified through faith in Christ alone, not by works of the law or anything that you can cling to with your hand. The eternal Son of God took on flesh and was crucified so that we who by faith trust in Him can survive the judgment of God. But faith in Jesus doesn't just mean that we're going to survive. Faith in Jesus means that we will be fully alive. And so what's at the heart of the gospel? Sinners who survive, Christ crucified. Number three, saints who are alive. I love Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. It's probably one of my top 10 passages in the Bible that I just love and quote. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Look at it there in your text. Here's what it says. It says that our life comes through the sacrifice of His life. Your life came because Christ was crucified. The law meant death. Faith in Jesus means life. And it's through Christ we have life in God. And there again, let me say this again, life in God comes through Christ crucified. Again, the ESV, look at the language. It it captures the Greek. It says this, I have been crucified with Christ. Do you see that? We have been. We were crucified crucified. Here's the question. When were we crucified? Here's the answer. When Christ was crucified. Talk about the mystery of salvation. His death then made the satisfaction for sin, not only for way back when, but each and every time again and again. You see, His death on the cross brought the power of sin to its knees and paid the full penalty for all of the sin of those who believe. This is why in church we sing a song. We say, Jesus paid it all. Not some of it. Not up until then. Not simply a piece of it. Jesus paid it all. You see, at the heart of the gospel, number four is grace vivified through Christ. God withholds what we deserve and gives us what we don't deserve. Through Christ, God withholds what we deserve and He gives us what we don't deserve. You say, what do I deserve? Go back to verse 15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. You know what you deserve? Same thing that I deserve. We deserve wrath. But He holds wrath back. And instead, the penalty for our sin is poured upon Jesus. 
That's important for you to have in your mind. Wrath doesn't just go away. It's not as if God just sweeps it underneath the cosmic rug and lets everything be all right. The penalty doesn't go away. Instead, Jesus pays the penalty for us. God shows us mercy in Jesus because Jesus received no mercy. He gives us what we don't deserve. Not only does He withhold what we do deserve, He gives us what we don't deserve. And this is, this is what we call grace, Him giving you what you don't deserve. You say, what did He give me that I don't deserve? He gave you justification. He gave you pardon. And that pardon means life. Christ lives in us. The life of Jesus now inside of us. We are united with Christ and we're alive. Look at the language. Galatians 2.20. And this is the exchange life principle. This is what this is. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Can you see why it's one of my favorite verses? Because in it, we have this exchange life principle where He takes our life and He gives us His life. He takes sin and He gives us righteousness. He takes brokenness and He gives us healing. He takes sorrow and He makes us blessed. He takes death and He gives us life. He takes disappointments And He gives us heaven. The life we now live, Paul says, is a life of faith. But look at the details of Galatians 2.20. In the Son who loved me and gave Himself for me. At the heart of the gospel, we see fifthly, the love of God realized. God demonstrates His love for us, Paul told another church, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, some of you forget this, that without Christ you have no hope. Some of you have been playing this church game a long time, And somehow in the back of your mind, you've forgotten and neglected this fact of what Paul's reminding us here, that it's not because of anything that you can do or should do or might done or no matter how good you are, the reason that you're accepted by God is because of all that Christ has done. God found you when you were still a sinner, not when you had it all figured out. You were a wreck. You were a mess. And God looked at you and said, you know, that one's mine. I love him. I love her. Look at how personal this is. Paul says, who, who gave himself for me, who loved me, Christ died for you. He died for me. He loves you. He loves me. I can't think of anything greater for you to know this morning. Let me tell you, and then you tell yourself. So I'm going to say it, and then you say it. God loves me. Now you say it. God loves me. There was a famous theologian, a man who wrote volume after volume He was a man well acclaimed that people would drive into, fly into. They would come to hear him when he would give his presentations. And he was asked one time by an audience, Professor, would you mind summarizing your entire theology? Summarize your entire theology. Man just wrote 13 volumes that's collecting in my library. How do you summarize everything in one thought? The professor, without missing a beat, he says, absolutely. I summarize my theology this way. 
Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves you this morning. How do you know? How do you know that Jesus loves you? You just simply have to look nowhere further than the cross of Christ. You see, the cross shows, it demonstrates how much God loves you. He stretched out his arms from pole to pole. And he demonstrates his love. He shows you what it means to be God by dying on a cross. He showed sinners how much he loved us when he died for us. And in the cross, he demonstrates his love for us. Again, Paul says one will scarcely die for a righteous person, someone who's got it all figured out and carried together, but God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. At the heart of the gospel is Jesus. Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus saves you, not because of what you can do, not because of what you might do, not because of anything else other than all that He has done. Look how pointed this is. I can't think of anywhere clearer than to say right here, if righteousness, verse 21, were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Anytime you think that you can be saved based upon anything that you can do, you know what you're saying? Christ, your death was meaningless. I don't think there's anyone within the sound of my voice that wants to say that. But the challenge for us comes not just saying it, but living like it. So here we go. You ready? Hopefully you wrote those truths down. Say these truths back to me. The heart of the gospel is first, sinners who survive, Christ crucified. Okay, we're falling off here. Saints who are alive, grace vivified, and the love of God realized. And it's my prayer for you that you know how much God loves you. You say, where do I look to see that? Just simply consider the cross upon which Jesus died. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this truth. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that through him we have salvation and life. Father, for the hypocrite out there, one who thinks that they're saved based upon what they can do or they're doing all of these good things, would you convict them of their sin? Let them know that they're wrong and help them to remember that Jesus paid it all. Father, for those out there who are not a Christian, they're, they're not believers in you. They believe in themselves. They don't believe in you. May they today receive salvation fresh. Father, for us, may we learn to delight in the cross of Christ. May we de determine, as Paul says in another place, to know nothing except Christ crucified. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen.